I am uh, running a little short on time and so I'm going to give the Reader's Digest version here. But I do want to thank Ed Miller for inviting me back uh, from last year's conference. I have to tell you all, it was the first time I've ever been asked back. So, <laughs> not to warn you of anything. Uh, also a special thanks to Father Michael Calais of the Congregation of Marians, who's our spiritual director and helper and assistant at the uh, Marian Helper Center and helps all the ministries. For those of you who do not know, the Divine Mercy website is thedivinemercy.org. It's uh, very simple, thedivinemercy.org. And you can go on there and click on about all the Mercy Apostolates, John Paul II Institute, which Dr. Stackpole is involved in, Mother of Mercy Messengers, Eucharistic Apostles, and the Nurses and Doctors for Divine Mercy. Plus, you can read and find out all what's going on uh, current articles in Divine Mercy. So write that down and remember it, thedivinemercy.org. Pardon my cough, I'm getting over a protracted bronchitis. The flu hit Tampa. I started growing some what I thought were feathers under my arms and I went to the doctor and I thought in my spiritual pride that I was becoming angelic, but <laughs> instead he told me I had the bird flu. So. As the speakers before me have mentioned, this message of divine mercy is really a message to be lived. God is love. And if there's one word that could sum up all of this, it has to do with love. You know, why do we do what we do? Paul said, why do I do the things I shouldn't and don't do the things I should? But if we can do things out of love, then we know that we're on the right track. And we look at the world today, all the killing, all the suffering, all the violence, and yet we kind of kill people too. We, we kill people with our arrogance and our pride and our tongue. And yet we are to actually be vessels and icons of mercy to a hurting world. When people look at us, they should see a Christian. They should see Jesus Christ in our eyes. And when we look at them, we should see the same. I'd like to talk for just a few minutes about a topic that I think is holding back so many of us from making spiritual progress. As I travel all over, I, I'm just so, every trip I go on, it's, I'm more convinced that this is the big stumbling block for people, and that is forgiveness. You know, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about trust, because below the image, Jesus said he wanted Jesus, I trust in you. But forgiveness is actually the precursor to trusting in God. The Catechism even says that, you know, you cannot accept God's mercy unless you extend mercy. And that forgiveness opens the door to his divine mercy. How many times have you said in your life, the Our Father? Father, forgive us our trespasses. Then we have this big two-letter word, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And yet we hold on to our anger. We hold on to our jealousy, our lack of forgiveness. And we expect God to forgive us. A few years ago, my father-in-law said to me, you know, it's a shame Ann Esther is going to her grave hating her mother. And I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? I knew Ann Esther and Uncle Joe as these devout Catholics, daily mass attendees. They never had any children and they were in their 70s at the time and they held hands. They looked like teenagers. And I just, what do you mean? He said, well, years before when they were dating, the mother told Esther, he said, well, why don't you drop Joe? He's just a baker. He's not going to make any money. Why don't you marry somebody like your sister Susie, an attorney, and you'll be much happier. Well, that infuriated Esther so much that she and Joe eloped and they never spoke to mom again. And when the mother died, the sister and her attorney husband absconded their share of the inheritance, so they never spoke to her sister. This went on for years and years and years, and they lived in the same city, and Aunt Esther and Uncle Joe, to me, are devout mass attendee daily communicants. And I'm just wondering, you know, how many graces were squandered? You know, it's like our hearts. This message of divine mercy is a message of the heart. 
you know, uh, it's a theological message, it's a scriptural message, but it comes down to a message of the heart. You don't have to be the most educated. St. Faustina only had two winners of education. And she got it more than anybody. In Ezekiel, it says, I'll take your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. A, a heart for caring and loving. That's what we need. We need heart transplants. We need fleshy, blood-flowing hearts that care and see the needs of others. But when we refuse to forgive our stony hearts, just let that graces run off. It's like Niagara Falls, you know, flowing all the time. God's mercy is pouring down on the earth, and we refuse to forgive. A few years ago in my office, my sister looked at me, and tears were streaming down her cheeks. And she's telling me an incident about my father and brother, of how my dad had given the brother bread and milk, and, and she was hungry, and... and he didn't do it for her, and, and this was like this incident happened yesterday, 30 years later. We need to pray for the grace of forgiveness. A few years ago in our cynical group, Teresa said, well, let me tell you what happened since last meeting. The week before, we had talked about forgiveness. She said, on Wednesday, my daughter called and said my first husband was terminally ill. She said, we went, we'd been divorced 20 years and he'd left the church in anger. And I felt I needed to go at his bedside. So on Friday, we went to his bedside and I asked for forgiveness. She said, the tension was so thick. For 20 years, there was never a kind word spoken between them. And he laid into her of all the things she had done wrong. And she said, well, let me tell you some of the ways you hurt me too. Was all said and done... They hugged, and they forgave each other, and they said their goodbyes. On Saturday, he called in a priest and went to confession, received Holy Communion and the anointing of the sick. On Sunday, he died. Now that, to me, is living divine mercy. You see, it's so important that we participate in, in the Mercy Sunday festivities. It's so important that we pray the chaplet. It's a Eucharistic prayer. I, I wish I had three hours, I, but I don't. But I'd love to tell you about the chaplet and the Eucharist and all these wonderful things that I've learned. And we have the novena and the image, the beautiful image, explain the image. But you know, if these things don't, Take our hearts and the Lord is the great physician. I used to think I was the great physician. But God is the great physician. And he, he's like got this golden suture and he wants to take his suture and just heal your scarred heart. All you have to do is ask him. You know the saying, let go and let God. Paul says, run the good race, fight the good fight. How can you run a good race when you're carrying around all these bricks and garbage? in bags of nonsense that you won't let go because you lack forgiveness. So this weekend, ponder in your life, over your lifetime, areas where there's lack of forgiveness and give it up. Let go. Jesus said below the image, I want Jesus, I trust in you. Now I'm the most trusting person when things are going well. I am a spirit-filled, prayer-filled, holy warrior. But you know, this last year has been tough. I'm 52 years old. My 50-year-old wife came in to my room. I was at the computer one night about 10 months ago and said, uh, I'm pregnant. And I looked at her and I said, are you kidding? And then all the doubts and the fears of a, what, what kind of child, you know, the genetic things and the 50-year-old wife going through labor and delivery, you know. I mean, I know the story of St. Gianna, and I'm like, are we having a redo here or something? <laughs> you know, you just, your mind runs. And, and I'm thinking all the, I have six, I have seven children now. And I'm thinking all the financial concerns and the worries, all these things, and... 
my head's spinning. I'm, okay, Lord. <laughs> and, and in July, we brought down my 91-year-old father and my 89-year-old mom. Mom has Alzheimer's disease, and we brought him down near us. Mom's in a unit. Dad's in assisted living. And so I, I have like nine children right now. <laughs> and you know, you, you do the best you can do, but it's like, it reminded me one time Mother Teresa was caressing the hair of some lady. She was had severe pain from cancer. And Mother Teresa says, well, just think every time you have that severe pain that Jesus is kissing you. And the lady looks at her and says, well, tell him to stop kissing me. <laughs> you know, but, but it comes down to, I, I've, I've been in the money. I've been in the medical career. I've been the fame and fortune seeker. It didn't work. It wasn't there. And I knew all these things that I had to go back to the basics. ABC, ask for mercy. Be merciful. Completely trust. That's the only antidote I knew. In 1995, we were blessed with a birth, live birth. My wife had three miscarriages. And after we had three children, then we had three miscarriages. And then in 95, we were blessed with the birth of little son, John Paul. But he nearly died at birth. And he was the fruit of a healed marriage. And he was the apple of my eye. And one day I had gone out into the back of our house. We have a lanai and a swimming pool. And I went out the gate and was out in the backyard. And just then my oldest boy said, Dad, come and start the lawnmower. And my oldest daughter said, Dad, it's time to go to swim practice. So off I went with the two girls. And about 20 minutes later, the phone call came on my cell phone. Dad, little John Paul's dead. Somebody left the pool gate open. So all the guilt and the shame, and who left the pool gate open? How did this doesn't happen to people like us, educated? We don't, who left the pool gate open? And I realized it was me. And on the way home, my two daughters were crying, and I'm just in a state of disbelief, praying to every saint and the Blessed Mother and Jesus. And I got to an intersection, and I realized, you know, the rubber hits the road here. Jesus, I trust in you. And as I was thinking at that red light, the scripture verse of Abraham offering Isaac came to my mind. He walked up that mountainside with faith, trusting that God would provide the sacrifice, but doing what the angel had asked. And so I said, Jesus, I'm giving him back. He's a gift. He's the apple in my eye. But I'm giving him back, and he's yours. I place my trust in you. The light turned green. I drove all the faster home, got around the corner, the squad had just arrived, he was sitting comatose, he was doughy, he was distended, non-responding, and I rode with him in the vehicle to the hospital. Called my sister who lived in a few hours south and said, please pray for John Paul tonight in your prayer group. They had a powerful prayer group. Over the next day and a half, John Paul got better and better and better every hour, and two days later he went home totally normal. <clears throat> my sister called the day after and said um, I want to tell you a story but I want to tell you in person they came up for Thanksgiving it was about three weeks later she said that that night they prayed for John Paul in prayer group and the next morning her best friend Irma had called and said don't worry John Paul's going to be fine she said I had a vision this morning when I was praying I saw Abraham Offer Isaac up to God. And Jesus stepped in the middle and gave him back. Now I want to tell you that those events don't happen very often, do they? We pray and we pray and our prayers don't seem to be answered. My sister, just two years older than me, four years ago, went in and had complications from radiation therapy and 31 days on the ICU and died a miserable death and as the 
doctor in the family, you know, the family said, what should we do? What should we do? One day it was up, the next day it was down. It was just up and down. It was an emotional roller coaster. And one day the priest said to me, Brian, just say the ultimate prayer. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean, Father? He said, thy will be done. And she died. And we were at peace that God's will was done. Jolie talked about suffering. Why is there suffering? You know, Paul wrote, he offered up his suffering to make up what is lacking in the church. And Faustina told us she suffered much. You can look at the saints and see they suffered much. She was humiliated, rejected. She had advanced tuberculosis. The other sisters thought she was a fake, a hysteric. But she said, through suffering, our love, love again, our love becomes crystallized. And I think of the chandelier in our house in the entrance. One day I was looking at the chandelier and I saw the bright Florida sun shining on it and the lights being refracted all over the room. And I looked on the wall off this broken glass and I saw all the little rainbows. And I thought, you know, that's us. We're just broken pieces of glass. But if we let that sun, if we let those rays of blood and water and mercy radiate through us and out to people, we become like rainbows to a hurting world. Some of you may think that you're nothing but a lump of coal. You're not educated, you're not smart enough, you're too fat, you're too this, you're too that, you got acne, whatever. You know, we're never good enough. Society tells us that. We're too short, we're too tall. A lump of coal. What happens to coal? when it becomes pressed and compressed and treated from the sufferings and the heat of life. It turns into a diamond. And that's what all of you are. Diamonds in the rough. Beautiful diamonds. Waiting to go out, ready to be launched to a world that is crying and begging for mercy. I don't need to stand up here and take a little time I have left to tell you how bad a shape it is. It's just unbelievable what we, through our greed and pride and corruption, do to ourselves. We're called to be merciful. Through our work down in Tampa over the years, we began collecting donations to give to the poor overseas. And that has slowed down now for several other reasons, but you know, we've shipped probably, I estimated one day, probably $30 million of donated medical supplies all over the world to 25, 30 different countries over the years. And it, it's great work. You know, the stuff just piles in equipment from the local hospitals and local donors and things. I'll find stuff at my front door. The Philippines, India, Peru, Ecuador, um, Rwanda, Ukraine, uh, many, many countries. But you know, it's, it's, it's easier for me to go work in the container and itemize items for a few hours and pack boxes than it is to forgive my daughter when she came home this last semester and had two C's and two F's on her college report card. It, it's easier to go visit some unknown person in a hospital than it is to forgive your wife when they have yelled at you and you've had a bad day. You know, you don't need to go travel unless God is calling you to, to go all over the world to find and experience and live divine mercy. It's right in front of you. All of us, all of our families are hurting. All of our families are broken. You know, I tell people we're all crackpots, and I'm your visual image. But you know the old saying, bloom where you're planted. It, it's tough. Father Pavone and I are dearest friends. And, you know, this beautiful little Claire that was born, Claire Therese, on December 22nd. Beautiful little girl. And I just pray for health and strength. And, but her book is waiting to be written, and I'm happy that I got to see part of it at least. And hopefully we'll see many, many, many years. But it's all it's up to God. And all I can do is be the best father I can. I would like to um, 
ask you when you leave here tonight to just tell yourself, God loves me. He does. Now we can say, yeah, but, 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 yeah, I did this and I... No, he loves you. He loves me. And if you can accept that, you know, you got the cross, you got God's love coming down to us, but then we have to go out the horizontal and give it to others. And that's what we're called to be, apostles of mercy, living mercy, showing mercy, and love, giving love under no false pretenses, no preconditions, just love. And I really believe